everyone. We are continuing our media history, thinking about the history of sonic media or media as sound, and looking back at the origins of recorded sound, the music industry, radio, and the current conditions of the music industry and podcasts today. We'll begin with chapter four, which focuses on sound recording and popular music. In this chapter, we will learn about the origins of recorded sound, the types of recorded sound, the transition from analog to digital, the ways in which the music industry and the production and sale for recorded sound has shifted over the years as recording modes have changed. And while our book focuses a lot on periods of music, we'll touch on this briefly, but we'll mostly be considering the social and political impacts of music. Our textbook notes the earliest pioneers and inventors responsible for creating some of the foundational technologies in sound recording in modern media. In the mid-19th century, Edward Leon Scott de Manville ran experiments to try to record different sounds and invented something called the phonautograph, which made squiggles on paper or glass coated in soot, but he wasn't able to play them back. Interestingly, they were actually played for the first time in 2008, long after his death. In 1877, Thomas Edison built on the work of Martinville and developed the phonograph that could both record sound and play it back using hollow wax tubes. A needle would vibrate and carve a sound into a tube. These were incredibly unstable. If you stored them in a hot attic in the summer, they would melt and so were pretty transient and didn't really catch on super well. Bell and Trainer's graphophone used a similar technology, so still the kind of cylinders and often wax about a decade later to develop another version of sound recording on cylinders. But it wasn't really until the gramophone, which was created by Emil Berliner in the 1880s, that we had like a truly successful version of easily storable, easily transportable music that could be played because it was on round, flat discs. And these were originally created out of glass. And it worked on a similar technology, vibration, and a needle carved the sound that would and repro could be reproduced and replayed later. This period of recording was called acoustic because it relied on these reverberations to create grooves and surfaces of cylinders and discs and did not require electricity. What followed was the electric era of sound recording or the electrical era, and it utilized electrified phonographs. To, but prior to this, they were cranks and other things that allowed for mo momentum, but then they transitioned into electrified for both recording and for playing them. And this made them easier to reproduce and also much more common as electricity became more common in people's households, so too did the photograph. The next innovation in electrical sound recording was the magnetic tape. So if you've ever come across a VHS tape or a cassette tape in somebody's garage sale, um, this is magnetic tape. So it, you'll, you might be familiar, it's uh, brown or black strips, shiny material, and the magnet is held onto that plastic strip. These were originally pioneered in the 1930s with reel-to-reel, -reel, so these really large ones like you see here in, our, in the image in this graphic. And reel-to-reel -reel was used in the 1930s during the war for broadcasting purposes because the quality was so strong in reel-to-reel -reel that it was really difficult to, to distinguish between a recorded audio and somebody speaking live. At the same time that magnetic tape was becoming possible, we're still also still seeing the increased popularity and expansion of records. By the 1940s, modern records were widely available and accessible products for people to have in their homes. People built record collections, and so you listened to music that was readily available to you in your own home, as opposed to the radio. Up until this point, people had been primarily listening to things that were set up for them. In 1958, stereo recording became a possibility, and this permitted the recording of two separate channels or tracks of sound, making for richer listening. And this eventually also led to the popularization of headphones or earphones. The early forms of sound recording we've been talking about up until this time, acoustic, electric, and magnetic, whether that's records or cassette tapes, are all what's referred to as analog. Analog captures sound waves on a material like vinyl or on cassette tapes by altering the physical material. This is distinct from digital recording, which is how most sound recording works now. In digital recording, the sound is translated into binary pulses and the information is stored on compact disks or in digital files like MP3s using a numerical code. This timeline helps to illustrate how in just under 100 years, sound recording technology has moved from its really early inventions in the mid to late 19th century 
to um, an everyday consumer device in the 20th and early 21st centuries and how quickly those evolutions happened. Digital sound recording begins in the 1970s and the compact disc, the first consumer digital recording product, emerges in the 1980s. But it doesn't really take off in popularity for almost a decade. In the early 1990s, this is really when the CD is catching on, so too at that same time, the technology for the MP3 or digital music file becomes possible. Digital sound recording is further popularized in the internet age because of the popularity of file sharing. MP3s and other digital formats were smaller, which made them easier to store and really easy to share through the internet networks. And you can see here an image of this is what the interface of LimeWire or Napster would have looked like back in the day. You would search for a band or a song title, any all of the other people who had uploaded that file and you could choose. And sometimes it would be a terrible file and it would be really bad quality and you didn't really know until after you had downloaded it. And this is a really good sort of representation of how the networks worked. Early sharing sites like Napster and LimeWire raised a lot of legal questions because people were sharing copyrighted music. One person pays for it and then they upload it to the internet and many people access it. And so this created the concept of digital piracy. The record industry filed many lawsuits against these file sharing sites with many eventually being forced to shut down. Napster maintained some sort of presence with a rebrand and a restructuring, but all in all, these things were essentially completely destroyed by the lawsuits. Eventually, the record industry started to embrace the MP3 file through paid forms of file sharing, like that pioneered by iTunes, which launched in 2003, along with the iPod. And this became the first form of legal online music distribution for the record industry. And it also expanded with the introduction of the iPhone. And this format dominated until about 2013 when so up until this point people were still largely buying files that they could listen to offline following itunes was the idea of streaming music where users typically pay for access to music instead of paying for their own music which is wow how most of us do it now in itunes you would have paid to own something own a particular album or a song and in streaming you pay for access to this music so you don't own any of the individual albums or songs Streaming today takes the place takes place on a variety of platforms, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music, SoundCloud. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with platforms I'm not familiar with, and neither is our textbook. And I'd love to hear from you on what those are. These platforms often have two different types of streaming. So there's streaming music, which allows listeners to listen to any music on the platform on demand. And that's usually a premium service on streaming platforms, so paid. Most types of streaming also have some version of streaming radio, which allow users to pick a style or a genre of music to listen to, but not necessarily to pick individual songs or artists. And usually this is a service that's available for free on streaming platforms. And we can think a little bit about why that might be, what the purposes of those are. So we can imagine that a lot of these free access uh, platforms are gathering data about what it is we choose to listen to, what we skip when we're on radio modes, um, and also using it as an opportunity to advertise new musicians that they're trying to push forward and um, hopefully get people more interested in so that they as a company can profit more on them. Chapter four also covers the rise of many genres of music that come along with technological developments in sound recording and file sharing. One genre of music they discuss is pop music, or music that appeals to a wide selection of the public or population. So pop music becomes a major business enter enterprise in the 20th century as more people had recorded music in their homes, like we just talked about because of the ability to do so with the phonograph and later record players, and access to radio and television. People wanted music that they found pleasant and appealing and often that they were familiar with from other contexts like radio or television or films. And so there became an incredible industry developed around making sure that these were easily uh, sellable and formulates uh, ideas of what counts as good pop music. Tin Pan Alley in New York City on 28th Street was the cradle of the music industry in the United States at the time. American popular music as we know it was first manufactured and promoted here and this is in the 19th teens and 20s. So popular music gives rise to a lot of different forms, and some of those then grow into other forms. Jazz was hugely popular in the 1920s and was really pretty radical for a lot of people's experience. If you think about the difference between that sort of music and what people would have heard in, say, the 19-teens, just five years beforehand, it was pretty dramatic. And so out of jazz and some other forms, 
we end up with rock and roll, which grows out of historically black music traditions like jazz and the blues and also gospel music traditions and what's referred to as rhythm and blues. And this was also mixed in with influences from Irish and Scotch immigrants and later after what's referred to as the British invasion from England, but largely bringing together instruments and cultural practices, primarily from African-American populations and rural contexts that sort of shifted the way that popular music would have been sung and performed. Rock music worked to blur a lot of existing boundaries in music, but also in culture, including ideas of high and low culture, masculinity and femininity, the notions of what is the country and what is the city and what sort and those and the hierarchies between those differences between what it, what was marked as culturally north and culturally south in the United States. And also, as we see with the, the input of gospel, it also blurred lines between the sacred and the secular in music. So when we talk a little bit more in the radio section, we'll talk about how rock and roll was very much a process of gatekeeping and turning a lot of black culture into white performances that could be sold and could be made public and profitable in the radio. And so at the same time that rock and roll is developing, so too is another aspect of American music called soul, which was really related to rock and roll, but was largely organized around independent labels, often black managed. So transforming the rhythms and melodies of older R&B, pop, and even early rock and roll, um, this became labeled as soul music. These artists countered the British invasion um, of early rock and roll with powerful vocal performances. They mixed gospel and blues with emotion and lyrics drawn from American Black experience. And soul contrasted sharply with the emphasis on loud, fast instrumentals and lighter lyrical concerns that characterized a lot of um, rock music. The most prominent independent label that nurtured soul and Black popular music was Motown, and that was established in 1959 by the former Detroit auto worker and songwriter Barry Gordy, pictured here. I added a, a link to a really good playlist in your optional media for this week. If you're unfamiliar with this period of music, I hope you'll take a listen. You may notice a lot of the sounds will be familiar to you, even if you've never really listened to soul music before, because a huge amount of it has been sampled by much more recent rap and hip hop, which you may be familiar with. So while Motown emerges in the 50s, it, it grows at the same time as rock and roll. Eventually, rock and roll really does take over, and we have this growing segregation of radio formats, and so some stations really only play, play one kind of music or another, and there becomes a kind of dominance of mainstream white male rock performers. And in this context, the place of Black artists in the rock world diminished from the late 70s onward. These trends, combined with the rise of disco, created conditions for a backlash and the emergence of something that became known as hip-hop, a term that included vocalizations and also cutting or sampling, meaning taking things from other music formats, which I just mentioned, so go back and listen to Motown, and also emerged at the same time as breakdancing and poetry slams and graffiti art, so part of a whole culture of expression. The music industry initially saw hip-hop as a novelty, wrote it off despite the enormous success of these lovely guys here. This is the Sugar Hill Gang up here on the top, who were famous for Rapper's Delight, which has been sampled many times by contemporary musicians, but was released in 1979. And it itself sampled from a song by a group called Chic, and the song was called Good Times. Then in 1982, Grandmaster Flash released a song called The Message, and that had a very strong political take on urban Black life, building a tradition that was continued by artists like Public Enemy, Ice-T, Diggable Planet, a lot of different people through the 90s. In, and out of hip-hop group Gangster Rap, which addressed issues facing urban Black youth, it was also a really strong voice early on looking at police brutality against young Black men while it was simultaneously being blamed in the media for continued violence in urban environments. So music is always in tension with the fact that the industry is based on capital's principles while the work itself and the artists that are making it are primarily interested in expression. So these capitalist interests, privileged forms of music that were guaranteed to make labels money, not necessarily artists, things like pop music, as the music industry continues to change, along with different sound technologies, the industry adapts to continue to keep profits in the hands of companies 
though not necessarily in, in those of the artists. And our book does a really good job of explaining how there have been some crises. And there's also a link in your listening this week to an episode of Freakonomics about Spotify and the ways in which as we've been able to stream and stream music, we're quote unquote saving the music industry. There's a lot of money going into it, but it isn't necessarily going into the hands of the artists and creators. And so this is an important thing for us to pay attention to. And also how much it controls what it is, what kind of work gets made. After waves of punk and grunge, alternative and hip hop, the decline of top 40 radio and eventually the demise of MTV's total request live in the 90s, a countdown show, TRL, it seemed as though pop music and the era of big pop stars was pretty much waning. But there's been an incredible reemergence in recent years with the advent of iTunes. The era of digital downloads has again made the single, so the one song, the hit song, the dominant union of music. And this dominance has aided the reemergence of pop since songs with catchy hooks generate the most digital sales. And so this was also true way back in the day of cassettes, which was the first way that you could have also a single on a record. They were small and there was one on the back. Usually it was a B-side, but also this was available in cassettes. But in the age of CDs, this didn't really exist. So the return of the single through MP3s and through streaming services has brought back the age of pop music. Another reason we've had a reemergence of pop music is because we have fewer and fewer major labels that control more and more music. And so it's important for all of them to represent people who make really large sales. Um, so there's a major interest in making sure that the music that gets supported and sold and put on the radio is the music that, or various other formats, is the music that will make them the most profit. Uh, at the moment, the U.S. and global business is still constituted by an oligopoly, which is a business situation in which very few firms, in this case, Sony, Warner, Warner Brothers, and Universal control most of an industry's production and distribution resources. This global reach gives these firms a lot of influence over what types of music ga gain worldwide distribution and popular acceptance. And when we talk about radio, not only acceptance, but actual accessibility. The, in contrast to the three global players, though, some 5,000 large and small independent production houses, otherwise referred to as indie labels, record music that appears to be less commercial and more specific often. Indies require only a handful of people to operate them and so have a lot more flexibility in taking some risks in the kinds of music they play. For years, indies accounted for only 10 to 15 percent of all music releases. The digital formats in music have resulted in a leap in viability and market share for independent labels and have changed the cultural landscape of the music industry in the 20th century. With the advent of downloads and streaming, there's new diversity of independent label music that's become much more accessible. And so they have a market share of indies that's grown to almost one third of the U.S. recording industry. Pretty, pretty strong. So to close chapter four, music, like other forms of media, often reflects the social and political climate in which it's made. New forms of music are often controversial and seem to be res resisting or challenging norms in society. Some examples of this are folk music, which was a form of protest music in the 1960s against the Vietnam War and also against gender norms and in favor of civil rights. Punk, grunge, and indie music were seen as alternative responses to mainstream rock in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s and also often became sites of conversation about gender and class. Hip-hop and rap were responses to soul and disco that was popular in the 70s and 80s, but also became really important spaces for people to talk about Black experience in public life in a way that those earlier formats maybe didn't necessarily broach. Music is an important way that the boundaries of social life and culture are tested, serving as a critical form of free expression and social commentary. Like other media, Music tells stories that can help us better understand a given time or place and can even form connections across various boundaries, either of location or gender or race or class. And in these ways, music then serves to further democratic goals. However, there are many challenges and thinking about music as a democratic form of media, it's important to pay attention to the tension between the creativity of the music and its intentions and politics and the capitalist motivations. Thanks. So I'm going to pause now and head over to chapter five.